Well, greetings to my fellow members of the Hymn Society. I am Wayne Wold, and I am here in my congregation, First Lutheran Church in Ellicott City, Maryland. Um, I will surely miss being together at the summer's conference, but I am so very uh, grateful for the technology that allows us to connect and communicate this way, and for the people, the technologists that can work with that. So we won't be able to be as interactive uh, as, other, as we would have otherwise, but um, we will concentrate on um, on the benefits of being able to do it this way. We're going to focus today um, on improvisation, um, on the organ mostly and a bit on the piano. Um, special emphasis on those techniques that help us lead and encourage congregational singing. Um, improvisation can be seen as a scary word, but it need not be scary. Um, you are already uh, improvisers, uh, knowing that an improvisation is anything that you play that is not notated on the page. Let me say that again. Anything you play that is not notated on the page is an improvisation. So yes, hour-long organ symphonies in the French tradition certainly are improvisations. Um, creating complex fugues on the spot are improvisations, but also adding a repeat to cover a longer offering than usual, or an extending a procession for a wedding party that's a little slower than they were at the rehearsal. Um, adding a passing note or two is improvisation, and even making mistakes um, are improvisations if you treat them that way, because really in improvisation, there are no mistakes. It's what you do with, uh, with the pitches that you play, the notes that you, that you play, the keys that you hit, and what we deal with those. So I believe that everyone can improvise, um, but it does take practice and experience and bravery at first, and uh, one who is observant with eyes and ears. Um, most important, having that desire to be effective. So uh, yes, it is practice. It sounds uh, strange, counterintuitive, to say that you can practice uh, improvisations. Um, you will practice what you intend to do, perhaps, write down a few notes, it's still improvisation. Um, you might not do it the exact same way, you shouldn't expect it to, but every time you improvise, you are practicing your craft, trying out things, saying, oh, that doesn't work, or yes, that works, or yes, not in this instance, but some other time, that'll work. So I hope you, first of all, make experimenting a part of every practice session. Um, I say that with my organ students. I put right in their assignment book these pages to work on and also mess around, meaning explore the sounds on the organ and see what you can do. Um, it's not wasting time, it is creating your musicianship. Um, and also, yes, experience is important. Taking small steps, um, but uh, taking them and making them even larger as time goes on. Um, and yes, it's about being brave. We are taking some risks sometimes when we leave the page wondering, will this be effective or won't it? And sometimes it won't. Um, but we get more brave the more we do that. And we want to take risks to be more effective in our ministry. Uh, and yes, to be observant. Um, listen to others play. Um, see what composers have done. Even when we're, we're working on music that others have composed and notated, we can be observant and say, we, I like that chord progression. What is it? Maybe I can use that again sometime. Or I like that little pattern or that little motive. Um, what did the composer do here? Um, and where might I be able to use that idea or some variation on that? Uh, I always love the saying when people say, I see what you did there, right? Um, and that's uh, uh, when, when we notice what someone else has done to be, to be creative. So um, I see what you did there and I'm gonna borrow that idea myself. So today's topic again, improvisation, especially for the worship setting and even more specifically regarding the song of the assembly, whether we are singing hymns, songs, liturgical music. Um, as we know, improvisation can be impressive, and there is a place for this type. Um, improvisation like this draws, often draws attention to the skill of the player, perhaps the power of the organ. Um, many times in concerts, even postludes after a, a worship service can be times for doing that. Um, within the liturgy, our goals, I believe, should be a little bit different. Our number one goal is always that God be praised and the people be edified. That comes from no less than, than J.S. Bach. Um, so to engage the people, to make them want to sing. An introduction uh, can tell them an accompaniment not just when to sing, but how to sing, and most importantly, make them even wanting to sing and to bring out the meaning of the words. 
to make our praise more jubilant and our prayers more profound. Um, and as Bach used to write on his, uh, on his co compositions and in his improvisations, uh, soli deo gloria, all for the glory of God. So three areas of improvisation related to hymns, also we can call them songs, liturgical music, whatever, whenever we are asking the people to sing. And these are intros, things that uh, let them know what we're going to sing and when they should sing and hopefully how and make them want to sing. Also leading the singing itself and also creating voluntaries based on hymn tunes. Um, some traditions are called voluntaries, we might call them preludes, um, offertories, communion music, postludes and the like, um, creating them that are based on hymn tunes. I'm gonna jump into the second one of those, leading the singing, because I really believe that's the most important. Um, now we can't really be interactive on this as much, so sometimes I'll ask you to uh, answer these to yourself before I give what I think is my answer. So what is it that holds people together when they sing? And the answer to that, I hope, is of course rhythm. They can sing through all sorts of wrong notes, not that that's a good thing, but they can't sing through wrong rhythms. That's when they'll certainly fall away uh, and wait to join in, if at all. Um, knowing the hymns inside and out that we will be leading is very important. Um, I think it's important for us to think of those hymns away from the keyboard and away from the notation. Picture them as, as sound. Um, move your bodies with them. Um, those of us who are note readers, we often forget that music is an audible experience. We might think, I played all the notes and rhythms correctly, so obviously it's right. And that's not necessarily so. Um, we should get a, try to get a mental, physical image of the music and then work to transfer that goal through our playing. So we can do that by listening carefully, have others listen, record and listen to yourself. Always keep learning and analyzing what we do, um, the good and the not so good. So in our mind, um, before we even uh, finalize how we're going to lead this hymn, uh, try to envision the best tempo and even envision the best uh, pulse. Is it in four or is it in two? Um, is it in three or is it in one? I find that I make a lot of my decisions while I'm walking. Um, for example, the tune Beecher, which we'll hear a couple times today. Is it one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, or is it one and two and one and two and? Um, and I would argue that the second one is going to lead the singing better the more we, uh, the more we move it along. It doesn't go any faster or slower, it just feels differently. Um, Things that are in, in three, um, would, do they, would they feel better perhaps if we think of them as one? Is that one, two, three, one, two, and three? Or is it one and dum, ba, dum, dum? Again, same tempo. Uh, if the pulse is how it feels, how it, how it would feel best. So we transfer that vision then um, into our playing. I'm not saying that's an easy thing to do. That again comes with uh, a lot of experimentation and working, but finding that pulse, the best tempo. And as I said, I hope uh, we spend more time away from the keyboard and away from the page when we make those decisions. We might need the page to learn how to, how to do it, a tune if it's not a familiar tune to us, uh, not one that we have memorized. But from that point on, um, we should have a vision of what we have in mind. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about how we accomplish that a little bit later. Um, most hymnal pages, uh, traditional hymnals anyway, uh, are not organ music. This is not news to you. Uh, it's also not piano music, but it is more often um, SATB choral music. We get so accustomed to playing them after a while that we think of them as organ music or piano music. But when, every time we realize this doesn't really fit um, that bass line doesn't really fit the pedals very idiomatically. That uh, left hand part, there's a wide range uh, for my left hand trying to play that bass and that tenor line. Um, what do I do in those instances? Um, we are, uh, if we are playing hymns from such a hymnal format, we already are improvising. Um, by that we mean we're transcribing them for another instrument. In that instance, from a choral um, technique, one chorally meant to one for keyboard. So uh, I want us to think about the techniques that are unique 
to piano and those that are unique to organ um, to come up with some answers. How to best lead singing from the piano? How to best lead singing from the organ? And how can organists learn from pianists and vice versa? Now you might be both of those things, but when I'm here at the organ or over here at the piano, um, I, I tr take my organ abilities with me to the piano and vice versa. Um, so uh, I want you to think about this. I'm gonna give you a little moment. Uh, what does the piano do better uh, and more effectively um, than an organ? And what does an organ do a little bit better than a piano? While well, you think about that. So maybe we come up with some answers here. Um, one of the main differences is how we accomplish accented and unaccented notes um, on the organ versus the, the piano. Um, how is the rhythm more strongly conveyed? On a piano, uh, we often hear people say, I feel like I can sing better with the piano because I can feel the beats better. Uh, and because of the damper pedal, it's possible to play more octaves higher and more octaves lower. So there might be a benefit that the piano has to the organ. Um, what is the biggest weakness? Well, there we have the tone decays immediately after being struck. Have you ever seen a piece of music that has a crescendo over a whole note on a piano and you wonder, what were they thinking, right? How is that going to work? Um, what does an organ do better than a piano? Well, we have more volume variation, certainly more color. Um, perhaps most importantly, we have those sustained pitches. Um, we can hold those pitches as long as we want to, in fact, obnoxiously long, way, way too long than we sometimes um, should, especially those final chords on our preludes, right? Um, and uh, those higher and lower pitches are available through the stops that we draw, not having to play in octaves, right? Um, the biggest weakness on an organ, might be surprised to have an organist like myself say that, but if, if it is not played rhythmically, it does not convey rhythm um, as strongly. Um, now, my own experience does not include an organ and piano playing together to lead singing, but I know that that's a very strong tradition in, in many uh, denominations. Um, but I have experienced it, and I've worked with students for whom this was the norm. So it caused me to think a lot more about that, um, why that, why that works, why that's adopted so many ways. Um, if I think of the possible disadvantages, well, you have two different people. They're trying to agree on tempos. Uh, retards, starting and stopping, um, maybe the instruments are out of tune. Um, but I think of the advantages, um, I'm thinking maybe each one, each of those instruments uses its strengths to make up for its weaknesses of the other. Um, perhaps the, because the organ provides sustained pitches that the piano does not. And perhaps the piano provides a little more rhythmic clarity. So I'll just leave that there. I want you to think about, think about that. Uh, I'm not advocating it, uh, that that uh, be adopted, um, um, if that's not your tradition. And I think we can make uh, better use of, um, of the piano, borrowing some ideas from the organ, and the organ borrowing some ideas from the piano um, to do that. So let's, uh, let's move to some music. I'm going to use the, the hymn tune we call Finlandia, um, taken from um, Sibelius's uh, tone poem. And I'm going to play it, first of all, uh, as I would find it um, generally in, in, uh, the, in a hymn book, uh, in a choral, choral setting. I'm going to play it uh, on the organ first. And here's that same setting, really a choral setting, 
um, played on the piano. Either way, that certainly is a very beautiful melody, beautiful harmonization, so we're not going to question that at all. Uh, if you were singing this with the choir, um, I would suggest uh, you probably would have to encourage the singers to sing through those longer notes that land in the middle of the phrases. Or even grow on them, uh, because they are part of the growth process. Um, and that's problematic on the piano, and uh, which would tend, they would tend to decay. They're a little problematic on the organ, unless we're going to be using our swell box or crescendo pedal each time uh, we do that. So uh, some of the ar arranging, the improvising we might do, for example, to make that work on the piano is to enliven those longer notes, to keep them moving. And I'll say this is probably just as much for the congregation as it is for me who's playing it. Um, sometimes I might tend to lose count uh, on some of those longer notes, whether they're at the in the middle of the phrase or more likely with um, a lot of tunes at the end. They help me feel the pulse so that I hold that together. So these are rather uh, simple ar arpeggiations. You just take whatever chord is there, work through them, things that we know are very idiomatic um, to, um, to the piano. Nothing terribly creative here. Uh, other than it is on the page. I should also point out that um, these harmonizations that I've, uh, or settings I should say, that I put together will work with the harmony. Uh, if you don't have to stick with the harmony um, um, that's, that's listed in the book, then you have even more freedom. But these are actually staying within the harmony um, of, of the book. tell there I took advantage of being, how much easier it is to play octaves on a piano um, by, because of the, the damper pedal. So I played sometimes grabbing that upper octave, sometimes grabbing the lower octave, things that can happen a little more automatically on the organ. Um, let's return to the organ and use some of these uh, piano type techniques on the organ because a held note, uh, even though an organ can sustain a chord or a single pitch, still doesn't necessarily mean that rhythm will be expressed. So let's I'm going to borrow some of these ideas or arpeggiation or movement to keep the rhythm going even during those long notes. Meet you at the organ.
So just to summarize, um, playing rhythmically is going to be very important. On the organ, playing with, uh, with art great articulation, different subtleties of detachments and slurs. Um, we don't tie as many repeated notes as maybe we were taught or told to do. That's a whole other topic, but those are part of the things that express rhythm. Um, and enlivening then some of those longer held notes. And on the piano, using a variety of accents, again, accents and unaccents. If everything's equally legato, it does not express rhythm. If everything is equally accented, uh, or even marcato, if it's all equal, again, it does not express rhythm. It's that combination of strong and weak beats and pulses that is, expresses rhythm, and that's what holds people together. So enlivening those long notes is what important. So using some idiomatic piano techniques on the organ, and vice versa, can really enhance our, um, our leadership. I'm moving on to uh, our creating our intros and voluntaries, and I'm going to lump these together because many of the same ideas can, can work. Um, depending on your practice and tradition uh, in, in your parish, um, are, are other types of intros allowed? My very first uh, church where I played, uh, I was told the introduction to every hymn was one stanza straight through, nothing more, nothing less, nothing added, nothing left out. Um, and there's uh, nothing wrong with that necessarily. Uh, and many traditions, including my own here at a Lutheran church, um, creative intros are encouraged, or I can say they're at least tolerated, right? Uh, we follow the patterns of all, of all the greats in the past uh, who wrote organ chorales and also improvised, um, and it was a great part of, of introducing the hymns, and especially for, in the Lutheran tradition, the hymn of the day, that longer, uh, use a longer uh, intro on that hymn. It's the hymn that follows the sermon and the silence, and it's considered the chief hymn for that, um, for that liturgy. Um, so, intros and uh, hymn-based voluntaries. Uh, again, longer tradition in some uh, denominations than, uh, than others, but uh, playing our, our uh, preludes, postludes and like um, that are based on hymns that are being sung at that service is another way of making sure the music is seen as integral to that liturgy and not something just, uh, just to pass the time ahead of time. That's not always the case. A Lutheran friend of mine, I know remember in college playing for a church of another denomination, turned in her titles for a Sunday, and the church secretary called her and said, you've made a mistake, this, you know, we're already singing this hymn, you don't want to play an organ piece based on that. Um, and my friend said, no, that's exactly why I'm doing that. And um, the office worker said, well, that just seems so redundant. So again, there are many traditions in, in uh, how that might be the case. But uh, my use of, of, uh, of, of organ chorales, or choral preludes as people call them, or hymn-based tunes, uh, again, it points again to the song of the people as being the most important music in worship. It's where people are connected the most. Um, music connected with words, the words and the music are together, and I believe sends that strong uh, message. Um, I love hearing people humming or whistling one of the hymns after a service is over during coffee hour. And often it's that closing hymn and or perhaps a postlude on one of the hymns that was, uh, that was sung. Um, so we can certainly find uh, all, all these things that are, are written and published out there. I'm guilty for quite a few of those volumes myself. Um, but improvising them can, uh, can make even more spur of the moment uh, appropriate music and can save money in the long run. So how to avoid uh, rambling when sometimes when we first start uh, improvising, we may just go back to the same old chord progressions over and over. Um, one of the first important things to do, again, following the ideas of the great masters, was uh, use ideas from within the tune itself. Little rhythmic motifs, melodic motifs, uh, and maybe even ones that bring to mind um, the, the text that, that uh, connected with that phrase. I'm going to point out some things using uh, that tune again, Beecher, a tune by John Zundel. Uh, which some traditions often sing to love divine, all love's excelling. Um, just going to show an example here from, um, from a few different uh, measures, a few different ideas uh, where we could draw uh, from these to give, the, give our improvisations some cohesiveness. So coming from the very first measure of this piece, uh, sounds pretty mundane by itself, but what if we uh, built on that and built triads? idea from there and that little motif by itself 
brings to mind the words love divine, right? So again, it's not just a fragment of the melody, as interesting as it might be, it's connected with some very important words. Uh, even the second measure. One of the great techniques we can use to give a piece cohesiveness is the idea of sequencing, not just repetition, but moving it around to somewhere else. And going from there. Um, here's uh, another one. That little motif by itself, maybe even put that on the pedal. One of the uh, measures farther in that I find especially useful is this one. Because it's got that bigger leap into it, that feeling of aspiration. Uh, and you can go any direction with, uh, with this. Um, here it's th treating it kind of gently. bring the whole tune if you want, or you can just leave it at that. It just sort of hints at it. But that same little melody also could be a toccata figure. We're going to show an example of that again a little bit later. Right? Generally speaking, if we're using something as a sequence, there's something about three and four times is the magic number. After that, it starts to get um, a little dull and too predictable. Uh, in a fast enough, in a toccata-like figure, there it doesn't seem to have uh, that limitation at all. It just seems to change perhaps when the harmony uh, needs, needs to change. I put together a handout called, called Techniques for Improvisation um, that will be available um, through, the, uh, through the Hymn Society uh, resources um, that I'll be referring to today, so um, you can uh, you will have a chance to study these a little more closely. Um, some of these ideas, techniques for improvisation, again, uh, you can decide, are they there for making voluntaries? Uh, could I maybe make use of these uh, as hymn intros? Some of them, um, not so much as intros, but other as voluntaries. Uh, one area we can make use of is change of mode. Usually means from major to minor, or minor to, to major, or even some other modes. Um, and that gives that little degree of recognition and little degree of something uh, different. So here's using the uh, American tune Land of Rest uh, in a minor key. And I've just put in a bass line of descending steps. using another tune that's in major, but um, martyrdom, that we often sing, alas, and did my savior bleed. Um, so this uh, might add some more poignancy and meaning to it if we used it not as a hymn intro in this instance, but as a voluntary in minor.
added some other chords in there, but often you can play right out of the hymnal. Just think of the different, uh, different key signature and sometimes then raising that seventh degree of the scale in the minor. Um, sometimes if we just ignore the, um, uh, the key signature altogether, we come up with some interesting sounds. Again, these were, would be some different modes, not major or minor. So if we had the tune uh, Truro, um, lift up your heads, ye mighty gates, or Christ is alive, let Christians sing. Um, what if I just ignored the, uh, the key signature? strangeness it adds to that but it certainly reflects it it's a combination of something familiar with something that's uh, that's a little different um, moving on to another uh, technique is called uh, calling and filling in the gaps and that's just uh, moving the melody along filling in the spaces where there are leaps um, and I've taken this in two different ways first one is more like the trumpet tune um, style so here we have um, Lancashire uh, Lidano King Eternal or um, the day of resurrection um, can add a little festivity to that. familiar tune, people are going to be able to sing that very well, and it's got even more excitement than just playing it with longer notes. Um, perhaps Nisia, Holy, Holy, Holy. Or a Diademata, Crown with Many Crowns. Again, get all your ideas from other well-known trumpet tunes and incorporate them and see what you can do um, into a hymn tune. Uh, another type of filling in the gaps in addition to a trumpet tune style, uh, I call the aria style, and that's uh, taking a much more slower uh, version uh, of the tune and filling it in. Um, think again of many of the ornamented chorales of Bach or Buxtehude, um, and uh, again, it can add a lot of, uh, bring out a lot of the meaning of the words that are in that. So here, the tune resignation. And here's one borrowing again ideas from what many other composers have done uh, as arias. perhaps with that wonderful tune known as Slain.
these harmonizations need not be any different from where they are in the hymn book, just to fill them in. Um, so there we have change, or filling in the gaps, as we're saying, the melody is hinted at, um, and especially if it's a well-known tune, um, just being hinted at is often better than just even playing it outright. Um, another thing we can do to a tune, a hymn tune, uh, is a change in, uh, in meter. So um, here's one that's normally in, in four, the tune Dix. We sing for the beauty of the earth, or as with gladness men of old, and I decided to put it in, um, in three. one that's usually in three, that's in three, take it in four. So here's Hepperdahl, um in, uh, in four. should go without saying that we're not going to do that as a hymn introduction, because I myself, if I played that um, as, uh, uh, as a, during the offering, for example, I would have a hard time casting it back in three for leading the singing. So um, make sure we practice them in our head before we play them. Um, or perhaps some, um, some meters that are a little uh, less regular. Um, that wonderful uh, uh, tune, In Dearest Freude. What if we tried that in, in five? All we have to do is take out the, uh, the half note in there, turn it into a quarter note. That type of, of jauntiness can really be, uh, really be effective. Again, something familiar, but doing it in something a little bit different way. Um, a piece that I started to use many years ago was the Christmas tune Gloria and Excelsis. I had a beginning student come in one day and that was the hymn she had chosen to play for her first hymn. And uh, all the notes were accurate but all the rhythms were ironed out and so it was, uh, every note was, was equal. twice the, uh, half that speed which made it even more interesting but as I was listening um, and she got much much better by the way that was her opening uh, opening uh, try at that I thought you know if you sped that up you could really make that uh, interesting um, so it turns out that there are seven notes in there so I turned it into um, into something in seven from there, right? So even, even the mistakes we make, more likely, or that we hear from someone else can, uh, can benefit uh, from those ideas. Um, moving on to another idea, and that's using a ground bass with variations above it, a very old, um, early, coming from the earliest medieval Renaissance um, Baroque music ideas, uh, a melody that goes in the bass and other variations above it. Um, so um, try one here perhaps with, with Duke Street. to stop um, a ground bass or a chaconne or a pasacaya, all those things are interrelated um, to make that to make that work. Or perhaps even with Italian hymn. Maybe we could make that into a, a bass repeated pattern.
I hope you're seeing already that many of these ideas could and should be combined, um, these uh, various ways of treating a tune. Um, how about imitation? That's again one of the great ways to give a piece some cohesiveness. It can be an exact echo um, or some type of variation on that. So how about um, Lonesome Valley, that uh, wonderful uh, spiritual. Um, just a dialogue between the left hand and the right hand. And I'm just gonna hold a note, a pedal point here in the, in the bass. especially well with tunes that have what folks in the military like to call hurry up and wait, where there's a lot of faster notes, faster moving notes, um, and then a longer note, and the moving notes can fill, to fill in the other, one, uh, the other one's open spaces. Which made me think of um, another American folk tune, O Wally Welly. Same idea. where you go, oh, that dissonance just doesn't work too well, and then you alter it. Everyone has done that. Um, some tunes work wonderfully ex exactly in canon, um, and they don't need to take any, any longer. So um, here's Laudus Domini, When Morning Gilds the Skies. Um, started out as, uh, as a canon by one measure, and then start to add a few more, few more chords. <laughs> Sometimes playing in canon can, uh, can get us a bit goofed up, especially in the beginning. We have to practice them, of course, but there's nothing wrong with, with uh, writing out at least the beginning of that or even the whole canon and then filling in the rest of the parts. Um, developing a motive, I discussed that a little bit already with, um, with some of the other uh, techniques, um, but especially using this idea of, of sequencing, finding a, a motif, motive, a uh, little pattern within it, um, that is interesting and can be developed, right? Um, so, um, to in Linstead, that we think of as uh, uh, let us talents and tongues employ, um, as this uh, opening. <laughs> what if I just took that first measure and sequenced that about three times and then did something different to bring it back down? from the end of the piece and did the same thing with that. This idea of taking a, a, an idea from the piece and sequencing it uh, can also work on a tune such as Lauda Anima, Praise My Soul, The King of Heaven. And here I chose uh, to highlight the Alleluia that comes at the end.
as you probably noticed that time, I inserted that idea in between the phrases of it also. Uh, many of the pieces today I do what I sort of call intro to the intro. I might take an idea from the hymn, uh, and then once I've worked with that, then play the whole hymn straight through, most importantly making sure there's not a break so that people know that this is still part of the intro, not time to sing. Um, that second one, again, uh, we often call the Ritornello pattern, where there's a short pattern that comes back between um, the phrases. Um, another uh, one built on sequencing, again, I'm going to return to that tune slain, uh, and uh, hear a, a gentle version of that. Um, just taking that, the highest point of that melody. Right, that wonderful climactic moment in that, uh, in that fine melody. And uh, using that then uh, as a little uh, voluntary on that tune or perhaps an intro to hearing that tune fully. don't always go the way I intend. That's again in improvisation. As you notice on that one, I used an idea from the hymn itself at the beginning, the hymn straight through, and then at the end. Maybe a little bit longer than I would use for a hymn intro, um, unless perhaps it was during communion, um, but a nice way of making a voluntary about around that hymn. Um, the uh, last hymn I'm going to um, include today is the tune we call St. Thomas. A lot of us sing it too, I love thy kingdom, Lord. Um, this again uh, starts with an idea of motivic development, taking an idea um, from actually the, the end of the tune. Turning that into a, a, a imitative pattern. This one combines a lot of the ideas. Imitative pattern going from thinner texture to thicker and turning that pattern into a toccata-like um, like figure. sound and double up on the uh, on the toccata patterns. Toccatas can be some of the most difficult things we play and also the most easiest. It all depends on how it fits under the hands. Nothing could be simpler than this. taking that toccata figure at the end and moving it upward. So that's a combination of sequencing, toccata figures, 
um, sort of everything that we've talked about um, today. So uh, in conclusion, I hope you've picked up some ideas here that you can make use of. Um, hope you've realized already, hey, I already do a lot of these things, so I feel better about my improvisational skills. So I'm going to encourage you again to explore. Uh, keep exploring, keep experimenting. Uh, some of the things we can actually study. Um, a lot of these come from my study and teaching of music theory, uh, saying, hey, there's a chord progression here in Mendelssohn that I can use, right? Um, again, studying compositions by others, asking, well, why does that piece work? I really like that piece of music, but asking, uh, why does it work? Or maybe if it doesn't work, ask why it doesn't. Um, sometimes I resent that what we do in our profession is called um, playing, it's sort of too bad. People say, oh, you just play the piano or play the organ, right? Um, because it has this frivolity sound to it. As we know, it's all hard work, but yet there is something to that. And especially when we think about improvisation, it really is about play, what I would call holy play. Um, so with that, I will depart um, and hope all is well with you and Sole Deo Gloria.